Welcome everyone to this week's Robotics Today seminar. I'm excited to introduce Kirsten Pettersen. Kirsten Pettersen is an assistant professor in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Cornell University. She also directs the Collective Embodied Intelligence Lab, which focuses on design and coordination of large robot collectives able to achieve complex behaviors beyond the reach of an individual and corresponding studies on how social insects do so in nature. I'm excited to hear her talk on form, function, and robotic superorganisms. Kirsten, take it away. Thank you, Jeanette, and thank you for that introduction. Um, I had to come up with an exciting title because there's been so many exciting talks before me. Um, everyone see my slides okay? I see Jeanette nodding. All right, hi everyone. Uh, so yeah, um, I run the Collective Embodied Intelligence Lab at Cornell. I'm an assistant professor. We're located in upstate New York. Um, and my lab is called the Collective Embodied Intelligence Lab. Uh, and so the name kind of indicates, you know, we design, we build, we operate robot collectives. Um, and we really try to focus not just on good algorithms, but rather on indirect coordination for the environment, how we can achieve intelligence like that. Um, and how we can achieve intelligence by using indirect intelligence incorporated into the body of the robots. So we work with robots. We also work with entomologists to better understand how social insects uh, leverage these same ideas in natural swarms. And we really work across uh, traditional rigid robots, soft robots, um, and even all the way to biohybrid systems. So I have a lot of amazing students, and I wish I could highlight everything they did today, but I don't have time. So uh, if you want to see more about what we do in the lab, please do follow our website. Um, yeah, so I think without further ado, let me just say that uh, please know that there are a lot of exciting, successful robot collectives out there already, right? So you all get packages every single day. Probably a lot of them come from Amazon. And in these warehouses, we have thousands of robots working together to bring your packages around the clock. It's a very, very exciting uh, robot collective success story. We have uh, robot collectives working in labs. So this is an example out of my old lab at Harvard where Mike Rubenstein and Radhika Nakpal really built these uh, thousand robot swarm that researchers can now get their hands on and work on real physical robots. And hopefully you've all seen these amazing light shows. So this one is from um, New Year's in Japan where thousands of drones come together uh, to, to do absolutely amazing and stunning shows. So within this set, uh, we're really sort of on the verge of a really exciting technological breakthroughs, but there's still many challenges left, right? So it's challenging to operate robot collectives in unpredictable real world scenarios. Uh, for example, ones where the dynamics of the scenario might be much more advanced than, than what we're seeing here in the air. It's challenging to make capable yet very inexpensive robots that can interact with their surroundings in physical ways. And it's challenging to coordinate robots robustly and with performance guarantees that we need. So we and many others in the field are working to try to solve some of these problems, uh, but the strategy that's sort of somewhat specific to my lab or, or a subset of labs out there at least is that we're looking to nature for inspiration. So why should you care about swarms in nature? Well, uh, here's an example of, of honeybees, which is a great example of social insects, right? These bees, they build comb, they forage, they nurse, they clean, they defend, they explore, and they allocate workers efficiently between all of these tasks. Uh, despite the fact that no single bee is sort of in charge of what to do. It's not like the queen sits there and tells them all what to do. So no single bee has a comprehensive view of the global state of the colony, but yet the way they coordinate is scalable, it's resilient, it's adaptive, and their coordination works on both small and large colonies. Now, if half the bees leave, the rest will coordinate. If a uh, few bees go crazy, their inputs drown out in the accumulative actions of all of the individuals. And so there's a rich scientific field, as I said, on how to try to design these emergent complex behaviors through swarm intelligence. But in my lab, we try to uh, understand the social insects um, a little bit more in detail. And we understand that some of the things that, that come from these social insects is not just uh, their ability to interact, but also this concept of form of function, in other words, uh, how their entire being has evolved with their environment, and this concept of superorganisms, which refer to how they add structure to the environment to help them coordinate and overcome their own limited capabilities. So we can take some of those notions and put them into robots. And I'll give you more examples of how we do that um, throughout these three examples uh, in my talk today. So Without further ado, I'll just jump right into the first one um, here, which is sort of a traditional rigid robust, but they're working in, in a collective. 
Um, and they're really focused on collective construction. So let me just give like a quick intro to why you should care about automated construction. Um, and, you know, I think the, the quick answer is, well, if we want to send Matt Damon to Mars very soon, then we should really have something for him to move into uh, when he gets there. Uh, and of course, in all of these extreme settings, it would be nice to have robots do the building for us. But a little closer to home, um, we're actually experiencing a huge generational trend or shift where in the 1800s, we only had 3% of the world population living in urban areas. But by 1950, we're already at 30% and that number is still growing. It's dropping a little bit now because of COVID, um, but it is still growing when more people are tending to, to uh, uh, move to the cities. And so we need much more sustainable and better ways in which we can do construction there. Construction is also an inherently dangerous sector. So in the US alone, we have more than 800 fatalities a year in the construction sector. Um, and it accounts for more than 20% of all work-related injuries. Finally, we're just in a huge humanitarian crisis. We have more than 1.6 billion people who lack adequate housing, according to the UN. And we add to that with more than 60 million people refugees annually. So the need for innovative, safe, efficient, inexpensive and sustainable construction has really never been greater. Okay, lots of people are working on these kinds of issues. Uh, just up in Rochester, New York, there's construction robotics where they have this massive robot arm that's mounted on a gantry and that can help uh, masons put down bricks about 10 times faster than they could on their own. They built very, very big structures all over the South already. Um, there's a lot of recent work come out of the, the original work from USC with the Rock Koshnevis where he did these 3D printed houses. Um, and we have cool work also from Europe, for instance, and, and many other places in the world. These are just examples where uh, these advanced robot arms will work together with drones to build these very, very big fiber uh, structures or pavilions. And we even have uh, examples out of Switzerland where lots of drones will come together to build like, uh, very big towers with bricks. So these are all super exciting examples. And I would say they all sort of have their specific uh, niches where they will work really, really well, right? So in the top two examples, the robots that we're erecting are typically bigger than the final structure we're creating. So it won't work in all cases. In the lower left example, right, we have these extremely expensive and very precision, uh, precise uh, robots where if any one of them fail, we're in very big trouble um, and on the right, we have robots that can build very, very big structures, but we also need to keep track of where every single robot and every single brick is at all times, which we can do inside, but not necessarily outside, and especially not as those robots are building structures that shield themselves from range. So what we've done is something that may look, look quite as impressive, but we basically started taking inspiration from nature and trying to figure out how can we build in much bigger swarms and with much, much um, lower key infrastructure. So there's lots of cool examples in nature of uh, swarms building, anywhere from small families of beavers uh, to hundreds of thousands of, of single-celled amoeba forming uh, structures out of their own bodies. And one of my favorite examples here are the mound building termites in Africa that are just tiny little termites, but millions of which can come together to form these amazing structures that are meter scale out of mud. We again, without a single uh, central point of intelligence telling them all what to do. So these are much more than just a pile of mud for the record. They're an intricate series of chambers and tunnels that regulates air to the nest site, which is underneath the mound. Um, and they're remarkably robust. So over here, you'll see a perfectly healthy mound with a perfectly healthy tree growing inside of it, right? This is the kind of resilience and scalability that we are hoping to get to uh, with the kinds of uh, robot swarms that, that we're working on. So now beyond the fact that this is obviously the kind of system that is worth emulating to create robust automated construction, we can also study termites in their natural habitats. And that has really helped us appreciate just how elegant a solution that we can come up with when we get to co-design everything in that solution. So by that, I mean that we can co-design our robots with the building material, with the algorithms, with the way the structure grows. And by, by, by sort of incorporating all of that and, and sort of designing all of that at the same time, um, we can come up with very robust and very simple solutions. And hopefully that becomes a little more clear in the following couple of slides. Okay, so mound building termites, right? Beyond just being very efficient, very robust and very scalable um, ways of coordinating, uh, they have a remarkably minimalistic approach to this. They have fairly simple locomotion. And by that, you know, I mean that they have to climb on the structure. It's not like they can fly or anything like that. Um, they have fairly limited sensing. They're very good olfactory, very good uh, mechano-vibrotactile sensing, but they're practically blind. Um, 
they have fairly restricted navigation, meaning they work perfectly as long as they're inside those tunnels that they've perfectly shaped and molded for themselves. But if you take them out of the mound, out of their natural setting, then they work not well at all. Um, and it turns out that a remarkable amount of the coordination they do to build these big structures is actually not through direct communication, uh, but rather through this implicit communication, which we call stigmergy, which is a way in which you can leave cues in the environment for future agents to react on, um, such that you don't have to always tell everyone what's going on at all times. So this video has played a couple of times by now, and you keep seeing these termites knocking over this little column. Um, and it's true, it is a very messy system, but because these termites are continuously inputting and, and optimizing and, and going over their structure, they'll eventually always come out with this sort of guaranteed high level outcome. And so these were really the ideas that we took to heart when we tried to um, build a robotic collective uh, for construction. So here you see the robots. They are very, very simple robots. They can build uh, user specified structures in three dimensions using this little brick cache over here that I keep filling. The robots are completely localized. They don't talk to each other. They use this stigma G to coordinate through their environment. And the robots really are very simple. The processor on board um, is not more complicated than your average Arduino. Uh, the sensors that they have on board are very simple IR and, and ultrasound sensors, uh, like many of the robots back in the day. So this is work I did uh, at Harvard uh, during my PhD, together with Radhika Nakpal and Justin Werfel. Um, and I like to point this out in the beginning because there's like a very crisp example of how this, this idea of form and function superorganisms really help us in robotics. Okay, so an overview of the system uh, basically works like this. We take a user input blueprint of the structure. We pass it to this offline compiler that generates a, a map of the structure. And the map is basically a 2D view of the structure with a number at each site specifying the height of the stack of bricks at that site and then some arrows that specify the traffic directions through the structure. So that helps the robot not meet each other head on. Uh, we then pass that map onto a set of robots, an arbitrary number of robots, along with an internal rule set, which is just dependent on their own mechanical abilities. And then we allow them to perform decentralized construction. So there's really two key components of this framework. Right? One is this offline compiler. We can give it any new structure. It'll tell us whether or not that structure is buildable. And if it's buildable, it'll produce a special map. And then there's this internal rule set that's just dependent on the particular mechanical abilities of the robots, but not the particular structure we're trying to build. And so together, these two really ensure that although these robots are very localized and very limited in their abilities, they can always safely add material to the structure. So I keep talking about limitations. Uh, let me break that down a little bit more for you. Here's a robot. Um, the robot can only climb one brick at a time, so it can climb up or down one brick, but it cannot climb a straight up wall. It can place a brick at its own level, but it can't place a brick above or below where it's standing. It can only sense its local vicinity, meaning the brick on which it's standing. So if it ever wanted to figure out whether it should place a brick, it would have to go past that site and then turn around and decide to add a brick there. So very, very, very simple robots. So in essence, what we have to be very careful with here is Despite the fact that the robots know very little about their environment, they can never accidentally create a gap that other robots can not fill, and they can never accidentally create a cliff uh, that other robots can't climb. Okay, so that's what our entire algorithmic uh, deal here is about. If we look at the aging rule set, it's very, very simple again. They get a brick from the brick cache, then they go to and follow the structure map. If the blueprints specify that a brick is needed at the site they just visited, and it's safe to attach a brick there, they add a brick. And if at any point they see another robot, they maintain their distance. So the big question is, how do we come up with when it's safe to add a brick? Um, and it turns out we can break it into a few limited discrete cases. So let's say the robot comes up from here. It goes over here, it turns around and decides to add a brick here. Well, that's not allowed because that would be placing it at a different level from where it's standing. It could come up from here and try to add a brick here, but it's the same problem. It could come up from here and it could physically add a brick here. But then it would be creating a gap that the next robot couldn't climb over, or a cliff rather. Now down here, it could physically move over, it could turn around, and it could place a brick if a brick is needed, and it would not hinder any of the future construction moves. So those actions are allowed. And the same is the case in, in the lower right corner. And so within this very uh, this set of very, very simple examples, um, the robot can actually just check its local vicinity against where it is in the structure. So it needs to know its absolute location. And that's enough to let the robot know um, if it can safely add a brick. 
And the entire rules that gets a little more complicated when we talk about multipath structures, but it's the same idea. Robots only have to keep track of their local location. And despite of the fact that's all they know, things could be happening any other way, anywhere else in the structure, the robots are still able to safely add bricks. Okay, so that's one piece of the puzzle. The other piece of the puzzle is this map. Um, and we recently uh, optimized these compilers in quite a few ways. So this was worked together with Yao and Deng and Yu and Hua and uh, Professor Nils Knapp at Cornell. Um, and I won't run you through all the boring details. Uh, it has to do with constraint satisfaction problems and, and many other uh, fun implementations, but we basically shown that uh, we can move through the entire search space of how these maps could be computed. We can pick the optimal solution uh, and we can do so in a matter of minutes um, on, on normal computers. Um, and we can even do it for unbuildable structures. So it turns out when you have uh, systems like this that have very sort of intricate rules in which structures they can build and not build, it's hard to predict which structures are buildable. And so you want to be able to quickly tell if a structure is not buildable, for instance. So as we looked into this, we also realized that now we can build structures with up to a million bricks. So that's on the order of magnitude as the Great Pyramid of, of Giza, which is something that we, we never even tried before. But once we start to look at something that big, we also realized that um, the, the transition probabilities in the structure start to become important. So it turns out that if a robot uh, were to build this big flat structure, and it chose randomly whether to go left or right at any point in time, um, then most of the robots would end up in the middle of the structure, which means that the edges would never get built, which means that the structure would never get built. And so here's an example simulation where robots are slowly trying to build out that structure, but the structure just becomes less and less likely to get built. And it turns out that we can just add optimized transition probabilities, again, just to that pre-compiled map, nothing more, but just an extra number for each transition between each location in the structure to allow the robots to build orders of magnitude faster. And so we now have software that can hopefully keep up. And so now we're back to looking at the hardware and figuring out how we can try to uh, make the hardware more reliable so we can eventually get to very, very big structures that can be built. Okay. So that was a little pitch about the compilers and this internal rule set. So now let's look at the actual robots. So um, the robots look like this. Um, they have bricks and the bricks are slightly bigger than a robot. So a robot fits on top of a uh, one brick wide wall. Uh, they have these wheel looking things on the side that are called wigs. It's a combination of legs and wheels. Um, it's a term coined by Roger Quinn at Case Western. They're called wigs. Um, and these are great for climbing over very uh, sort of unstructured terrain. They can basically climb taller than the radius of a wheel. Uh, and they're also great for climbing on the structure. So this is nice because all the robot has to do is move forward. And as it moves forward, it automatically climbs if it's trying to climb. Now we've added all of these, again, this is where we get to co-design the, the, the bricks and the material and the structure with the robot. We've added all these special features in the bricks that help the robot navigate. So there are indented bowls that help the robot turn if it's trying to turn. There are small notches on the side of the brick that helps it align as it's trying to move from one brick to the next. And these are all things that happen automatically without the robot having to think about it. It just moves forward or turns. Similarly, if you look at the gripper itself, it has these little prongs at the front that are forced inwards by torsion springs. If I lower the entire gripper, then the wall down here will automatically force those prongs open. That makes it really easy for the robot to grasp or release a brick. But as soon as I bring the claw back up, they snap back into place and hold that brick securely in place. Right? So all the robot has to do is lower and raise the claw, and the rest happens automatically in hardware. This is another example where all of these indented features in the top and bottom really help bricks stack and align uh, very easily, almost like Legos. So again, the robot is very simple because we got to co-design all parts of the system here. Uh, another nice thing that works with the robot is that they have these very simple uh, six uh, infrared sender and receivers underneath, and that allows them to pick up on black and white patterns on the bricks. So as they move across the structure, they can effectively count bricks in the structure and figure out their location with respect to the seed brick here. Um, that means that all the robots are doing is basically keeping track of their location in the structure. And then they're following the perimeter back around in order to enter the structure again. And that means that the robots never have to coordinate in the continuous environment with respect to anything but the structure. And the structure is something they can keep expanding. So this is really nice because it's similar to those termites that would never leave their mound. In order to make the mound bigger, they simply grow the structure and that gives them more of a chance of coordinating in the environment. So that was a, a quick pitch about the hardware. I hope some of it came across. Um, 
And then uh, I want to just recapitulate on this uh, this idea that you know robots really are completely limited in memory. So this robot here, I asked it to build me a little simple three bridge structure, and it's just building, knows nothing. But I can come in and I can mess with the progress of the robot. The robot does not care and it doesn't know, right? The robot just keeps patrolling the structure. And whenever it sees something missing, it will add material to it. And this could be me or it could be 10 other robots. It doesn't matter, right? The point is that the robot really only needs localized knowledge in order to uh, perform the correct actions. Now, this may seem like very dedicated hardware that we can't expand much and that can't go beyond much beyond these uh, simple toy examples, but actually there's much we can still do. Um, here's a fun example from uh, Yao Deng and Owen Hua, where, for example, they added in little spring-loaded bricks uh, that would allow the robots to build with overhangs. And the idea here is that now instead of just building walls, we can actually start building bridges or even roofs. Um, and try to sort of expand the types of structures we're doing. And again, this is all in mechanical hardware, right? Like the robot is still just picking up bricks. It doesn't know that it's doing anything different. Um, but using localized knowledge, you can still safely add material to the structure. Okay, so that was a long story. Uh, all to uh, tell you that we can potentially do interesting things with very, very simple robots if we're very careful about how we do it. Uh, so then why aren't we sitting in a building built by robots? And I think that's a very fair question. Of course, the answer is that they they break, right? So reliability on research robots and even on good robots um, is not 100%. At some point, something is going to break. And that doesn't matter if I spend a five-year PhD building them or a 10-year PhD building them, something is going to break. And right now, we are not incorporating uh, probability or, or errors uh, into uh, our systems. And so that's something we're working on now, right? So one way to do it is we can make the robots better. Another way to do it is we can try to uh, figure out ways in our algorithms in which robots can deal with errors that are bound to happen. But a third way is doing more like the term are doing it, right? So this is how we approach the, the problem. We let an architect design a particular structure, and then we try to build that structure. But in real life, in what the termites are doing, right, they don't care about what the structure looks like. They care about the functionality of the structure. And so if we flip our framework and instead start uh, determining the success of the outcome of the robots as the functionality of the structure, then the robots have a lot more leeway in how to accomplish that goal. And they can continue optimizing towards that goal. And so this is an exciting direction that we and many other researchers are starting to take to construction now, where instead of specifying a particular architecture, we're specifying a particular functional property of a structure. Other uh, fun and interesting examples um, are ways in which instead of relying on uh, perfectly manufactured bricks, we could, for instance, use um, uh, continuous materials, much like the wax used in honeycomb, and then try to uh, still put that into regular pattern structures that will help the robots uh, coordinate, much like the, the regular bricks did that we could before. So there are many different ways in which we can combine these concepts and really leverage the idea of co-design um, in the structures and the robots. All right, so that was the first, like, third of my talk, where I gave you sort of a pitch on how the idea of form and function and robot superorganisms really work. Um, should we take some questions now, Jeanette, or should we keep going? Uh, yeah, we can actually ask one question that uh, was just posted on the Slido uh, interface, which I'm just going to pitch here as well. So if you go to our uh, web page of Robotics Today and go to the live stream, below the live stream, there's the Slido interface, and you can actually add questions. So this was to the audience. And the first question that was posted was by Robbie. And uh, this person is asking, uh, without central intelligence, I guess the insects are driven by their instinct. Would this agent rule set be equivalent to instinct in, in robots? I think that's a, a very good way to, to, to phrase it. Um, I think uh, there are many ways to look at it, right? So, so in our rule set, we had to have both the compiler, the pre-compiled plans, and we have to have the rule set. But that was because we were trying to accomplish a very specific thing. We're not trying to accomplish uh, a functionality. And if we were trying to accomplish a functionality, possibly we would have optimized the rule set for that functionality instead, and we could have done without the compiler. Um, evolution has put millions of years into designing these rule sets. So there's a lot of complexity that we don't understand yet. Um, right? and, and, and insects are doing things that are so much more complicated than our robots are doing. We're trying to do one thing, but they're trying to do 100 things at once. Um, but I think it's a, it's a fair analogy to make. All right, thanks. Then yeah, sure. we can uh, continue okay. your talk. 
Okay, so um, this was one example of sort of a traditional rigid robots where we have some plans and then we let some things sort of happen or spontaneously emerge and we ended up with structures that we could uh, guarantee became the right outcome. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about next is the concept of, because I can't actually show you the final outcome yet, we're not, we haven't uh, made it yet, um, but the concept of soft robot swarms. And the idea of soft robot swarms is that we're really starting to sort of embrace the idea that if we make the robots simple, so even simpler than the robots I showed you before, we can make them very robust and very, very cheap, and we can also have many, many more of them, and then we can potentially achieve much greater performance, at least on a statistical level, than we could before. So why do we think of soft robots at all? Well, there's this beautiful natural example of Dictyostelium discoidum, which is social slime mold, where these single-celled amoeba operate perfectly fine on their own. But when they start to starve, they'll aggregate, they'll form a slug. That slug will travel through the environment. And eventually, that slug will form a fruiting body made of a stock of dead cells and spores in the top that can fly off and repopulate new areas. So, this is this is like the ultimate example of a swarm, right? It's absolutely amazing. You have these incredibly simple individuals that can do very little on their own, but when they come together, they can not only move faster, they can also do this exceptional transformation where some of them decide to die and become rigid stalks, and some of them uh, become these spores that fly off, right? So what if we could build robots like this, right? Swarms of hyper simple robots, but many more of them that could do exceptionally adaptive things. Of course, the notion here is that if we're dealing with these partially stochastic robots operating in very, very close vicinity to each other and coordinating via environmental strain as, as these robots here are, then we also need to rethink these traditional rigid parts and instead move to more flexible architectures, which is where soft robots come in. So if you haven't seen soft robots before, uh, they're basically, many of them are basically fancy balloons. So this is a, a little soft robot designed by my students, uh, Timothy Duggan, Asana Uluk, and Logan Horowitz. Um, it's, it's a polymer-based robot. We're basically inflating these little cavities in here, and we've constrained the bottom part so it can't uh, inflate as much as the top part. And so when we inflate it, it moves in sort of pre prescribed ways. And the beauty of this new wave of soft robots, uh, soft, the, the soft robotic field, is that they can be very, very simple. They can be very inexpensive and very fast to produce. They also mechanically sort of adapt to external perturbations, like if they were to hit anything. They can be resilient to moisture, chemicals, wear and tear. Um, and, and there's a lot of opportunities in these kinds of robots. They can be very versatile, very resilient, very inexpensive. But of course, these are also new types of robots. And so we can't rely on the traditional library that we had with rigid robots. So there are challenges now in de defining the right kinds of actuators, the right kinds of sensors, uh, the right kinds of models to figure out what input drives the right output. Um, for robot swarms, right, we don't necessarily care that these robots work perfectly. They just need to work somewhat in the right orientation. And then if all of them do it, hopefully we achieve uh, the sum, something that is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, but the biggest problem with our current soft robots for mobile, for mobility, is this little backpack here. This little backpack is where all the rigidity is. It's where all the expenses is. It's where it's fragile. And that's the thing we're trying to minimize right now so we can get to actual small little amoeba-like robots. So the robot that you see here has, I think, six pumps and uh, the same number of valves. Those are big and expensive. They consume a lot of power. Um, and so we come up with various ways in which we can minimize this backpack. Here's a simple example of that. Uh, basically, we're using fluid resistance in this tube in order to create a traveling wave in this robot, despite the fact that there's only a single pump located behind the robot here. So we've now minimized the hardware that needs to drive the robot just by leveraging the morphology of the robot itself. And we've come up with slightly more advanced ways to do that so that we can design it a little more. And uh, I did that together with this uh, handsome group of fellows up here, Professor Rob Shepard, Stephen Seron, Chaim Futran, and uh, Professor Ben Murray, um, where we incorporated uh, poroelastic foam into the foams uh, or into the soft actuators. And again, there's just a single pump sitting out here at the inlet, you'll have to believe me. Um, and we're creating now a traveling wave down the length of the robot. And with a traveling wave, although it is slow, we can eventually generate motion again with just a single pump. So we basically minimize the size of that backpack so we can stick it on board these robots and have something interesting going. And I can show you many more examples. In fact, we don't even have to use fluids at all. Uh, we can use uh, dielectric elastomer actuators and so on and so forth. 
in order to make these kinds of uh, soft polymeric robots um, move and do exciting things. And this is a really, really exciting field. Um, I will show you one other uh, fun example, um, which is that basically you don't need to use water or air at all. You can use granular fluids like popcorn kernels. Um, and if you use popcorn kernels, this is a fun project done with some of my students. Um, you will see that not only if you want to pop them at the end of the day, can you achieve an expansion of more than 10 times, you can achieve a change in viscosity of the granular fluid by more than 10 times. You can change uh, the, the modulus of elasticity by 50 times. They have a tremendous popping force and they change biodegradability by quite a bit. And so there's lots of fun things we can do when we throw all the traditional notions of robotics away and start thinking of robots in whole new ways. Okay, and of course, if we wanted to actually use small soft robots to eventually create structures, this might not be a bad way to go. Okay, so I can't yet, as I said, show you a soft fluidic robot swarm. It is just around the corner, but it has not been published yet. Uh, for now, I can show you another type of soft robot that we've made in our lab that can interact physically in large swarms, kind of like slime molds. Okay, so this is from my students, uh, actually a large student body. I think one of them is a panelist even today. Um, but uh, it was led by my grad students, Nyla Wilson and Steven Saren. Um, and these robots here are based on very simple, flexible circuit boards that you can use to create very inexpensive, very rapid, and use very low precision manufacturing to create robots. Okay, so here's the flexible circuit board. Uh, the flexibility kind of makes physical interactions between modules and between modules and their environment very safe, but also permits much larger assemblies despite of these low manufacturing tolerances. All of these modules have onboard processing, sensing, and communication. To lower wear and maintenance, they actually don't have any internally moving parts. They just have these little switchable magnets on their perimeters. So together with other robots, they can collaboratively move. Um, and, and that means that although, again, every single robot is incredibly simple here, in big collaborations, we can potentially achieve pretty sophisticated behavior. So we worked out uh, very centralized and decentralized controllers uh, for navigating and measuring out cluttered environments. Um, and we're very excited to keep using these robots um, in, in new and innovative ways. So we're basically starting to wrap our head around uh, sort of the extraordinary potential of these kinds of soft robot swarms where individual robots really can't do much, but they're also very reliable and we can have many of them and we can have uh, much greater numbers where you basically start to embrace the sort of the, the probabilistic nature of their physical interactions in order to do great things. Okay, so I've taken you on a little bit of a journey now uh, from uh, basically these sort of deterministic robots, more or less deterministic robots, to fairly probabilistic robots. And now what I'd like to do, unless there are any questions. We're good. Um yeah i mean there are some questions so we can go into them there's like a really interesting one i, I thought it's like by daniel drew um oh, I and, <laughs> and uh, uh, this person is asking any thoughts on how to give you our simple swarm platform stability to leave environmental traces for stigmergic coordination uh, rfid virtual pheromones or physical modifications well, i think all of those are, are great examples then uh I think, so uh, let me put it this way. Uh, I think we're in, in, I think when the field started, uh, communication overheads and computation was really expensive, right? And so back then it seemed very plausible that robots could leave things in their environment and then stick magically coordinate to achieve really great things. And then we kind of got to a point now where like, you know, every single person is walking around with a, a sort of a heavyweight computer in their back pocket. Um, and so now we can potentially do a lot just with wireless communication. So we may not need to actually leverage these forms of stigmatic communication, but I do think it is a great fallback mechanism for many robots. Um, I think there's a lot of exciting potential in uh, sort of mechanisms where many robots can work together and just harvest or leverage the fact that they are physically interacting with the environment. So I think once the task is that you have to interact with the environment anyway, why not try to modify uh, the strategy with which you interact with your environment in such a way that you can also leave cues in that uh, modification. And I suspect if you ask Sabine Howard, who is also on the panel today, she will have a, a much clearer version of that answer. <laughs> Hopefully that answered it. Yeah, great. Thanks, uh, Kirsten. So yeah, maybe we can just uh, move Okay, to we'll go on. <laughs> All right. Um, so basically, we've now been on a story through these fairly deterministic robots. 
and then to these fairly soft robots, uh, or probabilistic robots, if you will. Um, and now what I would like to do is tell you about a swarm that isn't robots at all. Uh, it's rather one where we sort of married recent technological advances with actual insects. And the reason why we've done it is because they have much greater performance characteristics when they operate in the real world than our robots do currently. So this is very recent work. Um, and it's worked together with my collaborators, Phoebe Koenig, uh, grad students Haran abdel Rasik, and uh, Daniel Palmer and Professor Al Milner. So the task we're addressing here is not construction and it's not soft robot exploration. The task we're addressing is how can we monitor bloom and pollination events in the field? Okay, so this is something that's really pertinent because approximately 75% of all agricultural crops today require pollination. And that's an ecosystem that's valued at around $170 billion in worldwide annual revenue. Um, a lot of that happens from managed pollinators like honeybees, and those alone bring in $150 billion a year in worldwide revenue. So global reliance on pollination is actually expanding. We're needing more and more food um, and more and more vitamins. Uh, but farmers in many parts of the world actually suffer from increasingly unpredictable yields, partially due to climate change, partially due to dwindling populations of wild pollinators and unsustainable losses of managed bees. So it's becoming a real problem. We would love to know when orchards like these, for instance, are in bloom. They only bloom for two days in a row. So knowing when they're in bloom and then knowing how much they're getting pollinated would allow us to add in extra pollination where needed so we could really optimize yield. The problem is that using robots to monitor these kinds of brief and sparse events in cluttered orchards is practically impossible today, right? We're just not near the reliability that would need to be able to do that. However, the managed bees themselves actually do so extraordinarily well. They monitor, they share, they pool information effectively in the hive. And just like those ants in your kitchen, they always find all the food sources. So rather than trying to compete with them or try to work alongside them, we're actually trying to piggyback off their knowledge and then learn what they do. <laughs> okay. So what we're trying to do is develop these little tiny flight recorder backpacks that we can stick on top of honeybee foragers. Um, and then we can measure uh, their foraging flights, figure out where they go to, to, to bloom events, and then fly back into the hive, read that data off from the hive, and then try to tell the farmer something about what areas of their, their field are getting pollinated and which areas are in bloom. Now, of course, the data we're getting out is, is quite crappy. It's very limited what you can put on the back of a honeybee. Um, but we also have a lot of uh, modern Bayesian inference techniques that we can do to handle that data. And because the bees are social and they keep going to the same areas over and over again, we can refine our methods more and more and more. So I'll just give you a brief insight into what we're dealing with here. This is the Western honeybee, Aethis mellifera. Uh, we have tens of thousands of foragers in a typical colony. The max flight distance is, is quite big, but typically they stay within a couple of hundred meters from the hive. Uh, they can fly very fast, and here's the trick, they can't carry much. They can carry around 55 to 65 milligrams, um, and all of that weight is typically taken up by nectar and pollen. Now, that means that if we want to stick a backpack on there, and of course we don't want to take up all of the weight that the, or the payload that the honeybee can carry because we want it to be able to still do its job, um, that cuts down on the available and power and energy for that backpack. So this is, a, this is not a real backpack for the record. This is just our, our little example backpack. Um, the problem with cutting down on power and energy is that, that, that batteries and energy harvesters just require space and we don't have space on board this uh, little uh, honeybee. It also cuts down on sensor complexity. Physical sensors require physical volume to absorb uh, signal energy and it cuts down on data capacity, right? So digital memory just takes up physical size per bit. So, what we have to do here is really think very, very carefully about what we're going to stick into this little fright recorder. We can't do your traditional IMU uh, or GPS or anything like that. We have to come up with a very, very specific uh, sensor that can still measure uh, where this bee is flying. And so this, this is a fantastic technology that my collaborator Al Molnar has come up with, which is called angle sensitive pixels. And the idea is that you take a PN uh, junction down here, so basically a pixel from a camera, you put a grating over it and that creates the Talbot effect. So basically you create little uh, patterns of, of light and shade. Um, and now if you put two gratings in it, which you can do in CMOS technology, then you create a pixel that is responsive to particular frequencies or to particular angles of incident light. Right? so this one over here, for instance, is more uh, um, uh, sensitive to angles at a 10 degree angle, uh, to light at a 10 degree angle than one that has gratings that are shifted like this. 
And so if we do this, we can place many of these angle sensitive pixels next to each other in big arrays so that we have one pixel that is sensitive to every angle in the hemisphere. And now we can mechanically compute where the sun is. If we can mechanically compute where the sun is, then we don't need a lot of power to do it. And this is actually how the bees navigate anyway. So now what we have to do is look at how the bees fly. And it turns out to actually be in our favor. Near the hive, they'll do these funky orientation flights that are hard to record. Now near a feeder or a flower, they'll do other funky orientation flights that are hard to record. But in between, they do beeline flights, straight flights. And so as long as we record uh, you know, the, the angle of incidence, the angle to the sun, every so often, we can record these bee flights um, as they happen. And then we can try to integrate that data when they come back to the hive. Now, of course, this is going to be noisy data. We're going to get a lot of uh, data that we just don't get. There's going to be a lot of lost data. Um, but again, because we have these inference methods, we can eventually come up with a flight map. So this is from a simulated model. We have not actually yet gotten to try this out in the actual field. Um, but this is a, a simulated colony in a big orchard. Um, and we'll see here how the bees fly all over the place to scout out for uh, interesting areas of foraging. Um, and we can see that uh, in this, uh, sorry, this is our actual data. And this here is our estimated data of where the bees, where the areas of interest are. So in other words, um, where there is a sort of highest degree of pollination happening. Now, as I said, we don't yet have them on actual honeybees. I wish we did, but COVID didn't really permit that to happen. What I will say is uh, there has been initial tests. Here is the backpack. This is the actual chip in here, that little tiny blip there. Um, and instead of a bee, we had it on a student. And the student walked around the parking lot. So he walked from here to here. Then he did a little random walk here as if he was walking on a flower, did a little, another little random walk, and then walked all the way back. And just looking at the raw data, it actually already looks fairly good. And again, if we had a social colony of uh, students and or bees, uh, that would revisit these locations many times, we think we could predict these areas much, much better. So this is an exciting new opportunity. We're really starting to think about understanding very carefully uh, how the particular natural systems are operating and then leveraging those insights um, to extract knowledge that we wouldn't have otherwise. Okay, so that was my story through uh, traditional rigid robots to soft robots to biohybrid robots. Um, and I would like to just uh, finish here by thanking all of our amazing students, all of the many funding agencies that are making all this work happen, and of course, all of the fantastic collaborators that we have. I'll, uh, I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was a fantastic talk. Um, I'd like to introduce the panelists. I'll start with myself. Um, I'm Monroe Kennedy. I'm an assistant professor uh, in mechanical engineering at Stanford. Uh, with us today, we have uh, Professor Luca Carlone. He's a professor of aeronautics, uh, aeronautics and astronautics at MIT. Uh, we have with us a uh, guest, uh, Sabina Huert. Uh, she's a professor of robotics um, at the University of Bristol. Uh, and we have some fantastic student panelists as well. Uh, Claire Chen, Robin Brown, Rachel Holliday, and Carl Solvay. So with that, um, I will open it up to the panelists to begin our questions. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, that was a beautiful talk. It's so inspiring to see how you're designing these different uh, swarm systems from the natural world to the robotic world. And you started by showing the, the Amazon robots, which are you know, quite a centralized system with lots of infrastructure, more costly robots than the ones that we'd like to design in the swarm world. And, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is it's very reassuring because we understand how that system works and then it organizes things in the way we might sort of, you know, the boss would tell you what to do and where to go. Um, but I think the world built by swarms looks very different. It might look like termite mounds. It might, you know, uh, just, just be different in terms of how things look. That warehouse might look very messy if it's organized by a swarm, for example. So, so I was wondering first what you think the world built by swarms might look like, um, and then what we would need for people to buy into it. That's it. That's a great and very hard question. Thank you, Sabine. <laughs> No, I, I think you're absolutely right, right? So uh, for the record, like big, big companies have bought into this idea. I, I think um, uh, Autodesk and many other companies are working on, on exciting new ways in which you can think about infrastructure. So if you wanna 
design a school or a hospital, right? You might not care about the exact location of all the classrooms, but you might care that the classrooms are centered around the bathroom and the teacher's lounge is centered near the um, the kitchen. I'm making this up, sorry, I'm not, there's no prejudice here. Uh, <laughs> but, but if you specify it that way, right, then the organization could look completely different from the structures that we're used to, right? Um, the, the rooms would probably not be square rectilinear structures. They would probably be rounder and there'd probably be holes where some robots had failed and, and others had decided to fill in. Um, I think I actually, I, I highly doubt that people uh, have an easy time getting used to such things uh, from the get-go. I think uh, the ways for these robotic technologies to break into the field is in patches where, or in areas where we just can't, can't construct today. So in extreme areas, right? In, in areas like Mars, um, in areas in the, in the poles, underwater and deep sea uh, areas. I think once you break through there, you, you, you buy a bit of uh, goodwill <laughs> and then hopefully that reflects back on society today. I think you're absolutely right. Like it, it'll, it'll fundamentally change how we think. Right? The termite mounds never look the same from day to day. It could be that we get used to it. I think. I think there's also something about oh, just absolutely. That maybe there's something really beautiful and exciting and organic about how those the structures look. Great. Oh, for sure. And I, I think, like especially a lot of the structures that are coming out of um, southern Germany these days um, of ICD down there, you see these organic forms and shapes, and, and people people really appreciate it as art. I think it, people would take to it a little differently if it was your home, <laughs> but I hope they would get used to it. I also wondered with, with the bees, have you looked into maybe controlling them? So right now your payload allows you to, to monitor where they go, but would a natural next step be to, to help the bees and explore the environment more efficiently? I didn't, I didn't put it in here because I didn't, I didn't want to solicit any uh, ill will. We have a deep respect for the bees. We're working with uh, both uh, people who study natural pollinators and managed pollinators to try to aid pollination um, and really sort of appreciate the, the very hard work that they do um, and try to you know limit their influence of pesticides and and so on and so forth but we have actually looked into um, how we can help them pollinate um, in the sense that again if apples only bloom for two days uh, per year and it's a cold morning they may get out late they may not realize where there's blooms happening and so there might be critical hours lost of pollination um, and so uh, Phoebe Critic and a whole team of uh, students actually worked on making little bee shakers that mimic, um, that sounds horrible, but <laughs> it mimics uh, ways in which bees actually shake each other in order to call for activity. Um, and it turns out that uh, a lot of that shaking signal is actually just mechanical and that's something we can just straight up emulate with uh, little mechanical vibrators. So we have looked into it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. I'll give a quick plug here. Um, if we have more questions from the audience, please feel free to post it uh, in Slideo and I'll turn it back over to some of our panelists. I have a question for you, Kirsten. Hello. Hi, hi. Uh, my question is, uh, you have highlighted that a feature of your robots is that they don't require very compute intensive processing or sophisticated sensors, um, but rather they exploit embodied intelligence. On the other hand, Many people design robots that re rely on powerful compute like GPUs and fancy sensors like depth cameras or LIDAR. Can these types of robots still have embodied intelligence? And what might this look like? Do you have some general thoughts on these two design paradigms? And is there maybe some sort of a middle ground? Yeah, no, I think absolutely. That's a great question. Thank you, Claire. Um, I don't think we're competing with each other in this discipline. I think everyone is finding their little niche and working on it. Um, I don't know if you can call machine learning a niche, but uh, <laughs> there are a lot of people working on very complex robots that can do absolutely amazing things, right? And then on the other hand, you have the robots that I presented today that can do very dedicated things, but not a lot more. Um, and so I think uh, what you want to appreciate is that we should definitely go for the super complicated robots, but it's nice for them always to have this fallback maneuver of being able to also communicate via Sigma D should communication cut out, should sensing cut out, or uh, should you want them to simply cooperate in more layers than just one, right? So they can sort of intelligently cooperate up here, but there can be this sort of a subsumption Rodney Brooks style architecture going on where at the very bottom layers, they're still also trying to coordinate via Sigma D. Um, 
that being said, we all only have 24 hours in the day. And so I think everyone is working on their own things, but I hopefully in the future, these things will be merged. Um, especially again, as processes are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. I mean, it's not hard for me now to stick on a full computer on one of these robots and they're like 30 bucks, you know, <laughs> they cost almost the same as a normal Arduino board. Hi, so there's an anonymous question from the audience asking you to go into a little bit more detail about the fluid wave uh, used in the soft robotics tech. Um, sure. Let me, in that case, let me actually find that slide again and maybe share it. Uh, one second. Here we go. Uh, where did you all go? There you are. Okay, now you see yourself. That's no good. Here it is. Uh, does everyone see this? Yeah, okay. So the idea here is that the first robots I showed you, this robot here, uh, just has little air pumps, it's little aquarium pumps that uh, sequentially, or um, you know, just uh, sort of repeatedly fill these chambers with air, much like you would with a helium balloon. Um, now what we did here was we used a much higher viscosity fluid uh, water Right, which takes a while to travel through all of these tubes. So what will happen is we will insert water here. Now this chamber will inflate and then slowly water will make its way through the tube and into the second chamber, right? And that means that this one here inflates first and then this one inflates and then we try to drag out water again. What's gonna happen is this one's gonna drag out first and then this one. Um, so you actually end up with this little traveling wave happening here where first this one inflates and this one inflates and so you end up with differential friction that makes the robot move. And what's neat about this, right, is that you can control this morphology. You can just make this tube longer if you want there to be a longer delay between the two waves. You can uh, change the, the pressure of the pump, the, the, um, the amplitude of the voltage signal that you give the pump um, and how often you switch it. And so now just by playing around with the physical properties of your morphology of your robot, um, you can actually get sort of a remarkably sophisticated behaviors. So this traveling wave here um, is really limited by the fact that eventually the pressure equalizes everywhere. So you'll see that it's a traveling wave, but it's a damp traveling wave, right? These legs move much less than these, these legs. So there's definitely a limit to how far you can leverage um, sort of principles like this. Uh, but it is an interesting way in which we can really, really minimize the, the amount of rigid and expensive hardware that needs to go onto these types of robots. And um, we have we have more work coming out on this as well. Uh, so so follow up on our website, hopefully. I hope that answered the question. Yes, thank you. I have a question about the first part of the talk. I'm really curious how you come up with uh, the set of rules to, to tackle a certain tasks. So first of all, how do you know that the given set of rules is correct, that leads to a correct solution? And secondly, how do you know that it's optimal or leads to a good performance? Because I imagine that there is some trade-off between the simplicity of the rules that you come up with and the quality of the solution that you get eventually. So I, I hope that you can speak a little bit to that. That is that is absolutely true. That is really the holy grail for robotics right now, I would say. Um, so people address it in two ways. Uh, there are people like our lab that mostly address it bottom up. We have some intuition for how these robots would work. And then we try and try and try until they work. Or we look at natural systems, right? And sort of get some inspiration about how they work. And then we try to emulate that um, to the extent that it's useful. And then there are people that approach it top down and say like, okay, if this is the behavior I want, I'm gonna try to automatically um, synthesize the behavior that I want further down. So I'm gonna try to automatically synthesize the rules. But um, I think it's important to appreciate, right? That if, if I know the behavior of a robot, it's fairly easy to stick it into a simulator as long as they're not too complicated and then simulate a thousand of them and then figure out what's gonna happen. But it's much harder to do the opposite, right? To have a high level behavior in mind and then come up with all those low level rules. Um, so the people that do synthesis are absolutely amazing. Uh, we have some of them that do it right here at Cornell. Uh, the big problem is that it, it doesn't necessarily scale well, right? Like there's sort of an explosion of state space as you add more and more robots. Um, and formal guarantees for the robots are, are much, much, much harder. Uh, so you're absolutely right. There are people working on it. Uh, it is not my area of expertise, um, but it is certainly something that needs to be taken into consideration. And actually, 
uh, some of our recent work, as I sort of indicated in the talk, is related to errors because especially when you do construction where robots coordinate by physically modifying their environment and they are limited in their capabilities, errors propagate in very non-intuitive ways and they dominate the system as soon as you try to build any kind of big structure. And so it becomes very important to appreciate the error statistics of your system and then try to build around it um, or have small error correcting actions throughout. Cool, I see you nodding, so I assume that was an okay answer. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And so I have a follow-up question about uh, part one of the presentation. And first of all, let me say, like, you know, very amazing talk is, uh, is very, very inspiring. So I believe you mentioned this requirement that for the first part, like, you know, building this block structure, uh, you need the agents to keep track of the absolute location, their absolute location. And I was wondering if you can say a little bit more about that. I think you mentioned that they are kind of counting blocks as they go, but what happens when they get out of the structure and they have to walk back, like, you know, how do they keep track of their location? And uh, how do you compensate for failures? Because it seems that if you uh, just keep a single block, <laughs> then like you know, it's, you're doomed to fail, right? So, no, I, I, um, we're super excited about that line of research because it's what we're working on right now. Um, so first of all, I think it is it is a super exciting notion, and I think it's exciting to see that it also happens in biology because that lends it some amount of credibility that robots can simply extend the structure that they're building on in order to make sense of their environment, right? So if it was a continuous environment, really hard for the robots to figure out what to do, but because they're extending this rectilinear structure in their environment and they just coordinate with respect to that, right? They're really, they really can be quite, quite simple. Um, what happens is when they go off the structure, they just follow the perimeter back around. They have ultrasonic sensors until they see that entry path again. But you're right. Every so often robots make mistake and it actually happens uh, more often than you'd think, right? And so as the structure gets bigger, the chance of success drops exponentially. So we have small checks, right? So, uh, you know, if a robot can locally realize that it's made a mistake, then it simply corrects it and it moves on. If it locally realizes it's made a mistake, it can also just try to sort of probabilistically make its way off the structure until it actually makes its way off the structure and then just not add materials so it's not a problem for future robots. It also kamikaze off the side of the wall if it was very cheap, right? You would say, like, I don't care, just try to leave in any way possible. Um, but sometimes errors happen that we just can't fix, right? And then what do we do, right? So the classic example that people come up with is like, okay, well, then we insert one special robot that goes around and checks for those errors and that fixes those errors. But then what happens if that robot fails? Um, you know, and so there will always be some chance of failure, and that chance of failure is non neglectable when you go to really big structures. Um, and so I think it becomes much more interesting once you let the robots start to deviate a little bit from the plan, right? So if there's a robot that has failed, that is blocking the way here, or there's a brick that's placed in not the right position, how do you get to modify the plan in order to overcome those problems? Um, and that starts becoming really exciting. Uh, the connections with, uh, for example, SLAM, like simultaneous localization. <laughs> because it seems- it's, it's just know. give me like another half year. We're about to publish that. <laughs> yes, there are connections. <laughs> <Makes sense. laughs> and also I perfectly agree with what you say that essentially implicitly are discretizing the state space, which uh, is supposed to make the problem easier. Very nice. Okay, thanks. Yeah, exactly. Um, I will say there's not a direct correlation to SLAM, right? Because we're continuously changing the environment. The map is continuously changing. The nice thing about it is we have some idea of the structure of how it's changing. So there are ways in which we can combine the two, two thoughts. Got it. I have uh, um, another question, but I think we'll stop here because I think there are more from the audience. So let me stop here and we'll uh, get back. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I have an anonymous question from the audience. Um, and this okay. person was wondering, um, he said, functional design seems like a computationally intensive task. Are you aware of any efforts to decentralize this functional design computation or maybe reduce the complexity at all? Um, it, so I, I use the word broadly, uh, which is maybe unfair, um, but uh, there are many ways in which the decentralized computation happens. So the, the point of the functional design is that robots are performing computation as they're moving through the structure, right? So. If instead of saying that I wanted that particular castle, I could have specified that I wanted this approximate length of the walls and this approximate probability that they would turn, um, you know, in some direction, given uh, how far the robots had already moved along a straight sequence wall, right? That would be a functional specification where if at some point I failed in moving forward, at some point I would just decide to turn instead, right? 
So in that sense, it is already decentralized. Robots are continuously optimizing on the go. Um, I hope that sort of answers the question, right? But it's sort of, it's a question of whether you approach it from the traditional architect standpoint um, or a sort of the termite standpoint where in the architect standpoint, at least we kind of know what we're getting up front, which is very, very helpful, right? But then the robot standpoint, it's like, okay, well, but if I fail, am I allowed to just like sort of fiddle a little bit locally to try to make it work still? I had a question. And, about and probably there's some some notion, some some middle ground there. I had a question Sorry. about the soft robots. Sorry, I'm jumping in. Um, so, so on the soft robots, a, a lot of focus is on, on the locomotion to create these soft bodies. But actually, the bits that we need for the swarming um, is also the sensing both of the environment, potentially, and of your neighbors. And I was wondering if you've been thinking about how to make these soft materials um, communicate or, or interact locally. Yeah, that's a that's a very fair point, uh, and you're right. And there are lots of people, for the record, that are working on actuators that are much more sophisticated than the ones I showed you today. I just wanted to give you a gist uh, of what we're up against. Um, we are working on sensors. Uh, those sensors are on very different projects. Uh, they're related to agriculture, um, so I didn't quite felt feel like they fit into today's story. Um, and there are sensors out there. We're actually um, for swarms. Uh, beyond the fact that robots have to communicate, which of course is of interest. And I think actually Dandrew, who asked the question earlier, has some interesting ideas on how that might happen. Um, we're looking at how they might physically interact in order to come up with interesting uh, global behaviors. So if you look at some of the cool work out of Georgia Tech, like Dan Goldman's work of physically interacting robots, we can leverage some of those same principles where soft robots that actually get to physically interact can nudge each other in the right directions. Right? So if they all have uh, an idea of how their internal body is shaped and they can nudge each other, <laughs> right? Then that internal nudging um, also sort of affects how they think. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a very abstract way of explaining it, but I think there's a lot of exciting opportunity there. Yeah, no, it, it is an abstract. I could see how they would all be nudging each other and, and kind of moving <laughs> in a common direction. Great, thank you. <laughs> okay, let me ask maybe my follow-up question, which I think is connected to one, the one that Robin asked. So, um, I think in the first part of the talk, you were talking about this compiler, like, you know, taking the, the blueprint of the building that you want to build and translating that into rule set. Um, is there any hope that we can compile, we can have a compiler producing both the form as well as the rule set? Like, you know, let's say both the form and the function. And um, um, in other words, I'm asking, like, you know, do we have a hope to get a framework which, given a task, will design the best robot team for the task, both on the mechanical side and on the algorithmic side? And this is a question, I guess, uh, both about the design of the single robots, but it's also about the team design, because I'm imagining that uh, at some point for the construction task, there is going to be, there are going to be diminishing returns, right? If you have more robots, you will not perform better just because you spend more time handling conflicts rather than building stuff, right? So do we have any hope in that direction? Uh Absolutely. I'm hoping for researchers like you to solve that problem, Luca. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think uh, you know. Eventually, um, let me let me put it this way. Uh, I described a bottom-up and a top-down design approach, um, but hopefully, all fields eventually end up in the top-down approach, right? Hopefully, all fields eventually end up in the point where we understand the the concepts, the the, of the dynamics, um, sorry, the equations that govern the system so well that we do a top-down design, right? That we just sort of say, oh, well, we've just plugged that into the Luca Carlone equation, and then out comes all the little local behavioral rules and the optimal distribution of robots. Um, we're slowly starting to wrap our head, and we have initial ideas um, for how you can design uh, stigmergic rules given particular dynamics of environments in our group. And I hope uh, many other groups are as well, but a lot of collective us to get there because we still have a hard time uh, you know, across fields like mathematics, uh, biology, and robotics, uh, uh, wrapping our heads around how we design emergence in these kinds of complex systems. Now, robotics is a little simpler because we get to really control a lot of the parameters, but they are complex systems. Is that a fair question for answer? I think so. Yeah, there is a uh, Carlones equation <laughs> involved. So, okay, thanks. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm just going to jump in here. So we have like one classic robotics today question at this point. Thank you for the suggestion uh, that came in. Um, so what undergraduate coursework should students master if they wish to pursue this line of research? Because, ah. you know, as you said, like, oh, we can throw all the traditional, we can throw <laughs> away all these traditional robotics libraries, but then what are you left with? What should you do? Yeah, I did, I did say that. Um, maybe that came out wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, math, you need math. You just get, you cannot get around math. Uh, it is so handy. Um, I think, uh, let me put it this way. Undergrads in my lab and, and grad students in my lab and postdocs in my lab have a very wide background uh, from electrical engineering, to computer engineering, to uh, mechanical engineering, to um, entomology, biophysical systems, math, uh, you name it, systems design. Um, and I think as long everyone brings super interesting and great things to the table and we kind of need everyone from every different background to work together. But to work in engineering and to do a really good job with your robots, you, you need math. You can't get around math. Take math and then take, uh, you know, for the kinds of robots we're doing, um, hands-on experience is very important. You have to be willing to try a bunch of things and fail a bunch of times um, because you're learning a lot from every implementation. Uh, but of course, um, you know, it really depends on the particular kinds of robots that you want to do. Thanks, uh, thanks, Kirsten. Um, so one thing that I really like about your work is that it's at this interface between hardware and computer science. And um, I'm wondering, what do you think are the most, what are the typical trade-offs you are taking there? Um, what do you think has most um, potential to be pushed in hardware and become kind of morphological computation? And what do you think will always be traditional computation in a way? <laughs> uh, that is a great question. I think it depends on the task, right? So if we're pushing towards forms of micro robots, there's just a limit to how much computation we can put on there. And then we really do have to think very carefully about morphological computation. Um, you know, if we're talking centimeter scale robots these days, why not stick a computer on there? <laughs> you know, like why not? Um, but I do think I think we need to explore these parallel lines of research, everyone. I think there needs to be people like you, Jeanette, who just like explores these super sophisticated advanced robot techniques because we can and we should, um, and they enable us to do learning at a whole nother scale that we could otherwise. Um, but I do think the robots of the future will have sort of an interesting balance where like at the lower level, there's always some fundamental things going on as well. We all have brain processing and we think super complicated thoughts, but we also have small local internal things that deal with how we walk without having to think more carefully about it, right? And similarly, you can think about swarms uh, sort of having that kind of fallback tip, right? If we're, if we're designing our own robots anyway, why not, why not add that in? Um, I do think it is interesting and I, and I encourage everyone who works on robots to at least take a stab at looking at both hardware and software because once you get to design all parts of a system and once you get to for every new challenge you take on decide where to best solve it and really sort of weigh the balance um or, or weigh weigh uh, the cons and pros um you typically end up coming up with much much simpler solutions it's not an easy feat hardware is not easy i know that um <laughs> but i do think we get up we get some interesting solutions coming out of it I have a quick follow up. Uh, you mentioned about the, you know, for the students, it's important to get math background, like, you know, to be ready to, to contribute to this line of research. Uh, which branch of math? Like, you know, do you guys worry about discrete optimization? Do you worry about graph theory? Like, you know, what? Yeah, start? no, that, that's a great question. Again, it really depends on what you want to do. If you want to work on sophisticated swarm algorithms, uh, then yes, graph theory would be very handy. If you want to work on um, small robots like the ones we work on than you know uh, linear systems like what I'm guessing you have behind you uh, <laughs> you know becomes important um, probability uh, as we are looking into swarms become more and more important because we just we can't count on every robot's working like it's supposed to work right probabilistic robotics is becoming the new hot thing and it's it's really the way forward um, does that answer it? Yeah, I think it's it's very interesting to see that I would have answered pretty much the same thing while I'm doing a completely different research. I could have answered the same thing. So it, it tells a lot about how fundamental these tools are. Thanks. I so uh, I, I think like honestly, these days you can 
you know, everyone can go out and build or buy an Arduino, um, you know, it's like 10 bucks. Uh, I think the cheapest are $6. Um, you can build your own robot and you get really far with it and it's absolutely awesome. But once you want to start making fundamental contributions and, and dig into things a little bit deeper, um, you do need the, the foundational courses. Completely agree. Okay, uh, very cool. So I think it's time to wrap up. Um, and uh, I would like to thank again our speaker, Professor Kirsten Peterson, for the amazing presentation. It was very inspiring. Like, you know, I loved it. Um, and also our guest panelist, Sabina Huert. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, so we're not going to have a seminar on October 30th, since that's right before the ICRA deadline. I'm sure everybody will be busy with that. Uh, but robotics today is going to restart on November 13th. Uh, when we have the pleasure to have David Escaramuzza as our speaker. So until then, stay safe, good luck for ICRA, and see you next time.